Robert, good morning. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good Friday great. to you. Good Friday. Yeah, we're going to have a little bit of a lighter uh, group here this morning, but that's all good. It is, and this will live on in the Twitter sphere. So It will live on for eternity. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. <laughs> His words will be etched in stone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's noon. Let's get started. A um, number of things on my mind this morning. The first one is, you know, maybe not in your wheelhouse perfectly, but I'm sure you pay attention to it. Gold closed at 22 well, the official futures closed with 2238, but it actually ended up trading even higher in the final 30 minutes on Thursday. So we're we're actually in the June futures above 2250. What do you make of this this gold move? Insane, right? <laughs> um, I mean, look, it it occurred, and we we broke to all time highs at at PDAC, um, and I was quite skeptical at the time. Um, Because as you know, well, we've had three different head fakes since 2020. And so the probability seemed that this would be yet another one. Um, But after seeing the price action, particularly yesterday, but over the past over the past week, um, I'm now at the point of saying definitively, yes, this is the real breakout that we've been waiting for. And, you know, more TA minded investors, and I think you'd fall into that category, really wanted to see a monthly close in March. Uh, and, you know, Q1 quarterly close as well, above 2,100. And, and as you just noted, we got 22, very convincingly. Um, so th- this is a big deal. Um, I guess the other data point for, for those that are not yet convinced, another data point to look for would be for a break for silver um, above key resistance levels. The first would be 26 uh, and, then, and then 28 to my knowledge. Um, so I think that's, that's another thing to watch. Um, personally, I, I think this is actually, this is just a matter of time before we see that, um, because we are in the type of inflationary and, and risk on environment in which silver has historically thrived. Um, and then I, I'd also add that the fact that we've seen this move without the participation of Western financial institutions, uh, let alone retail investors, to me, that's a huge plus that actually makes me more bullish about, about the setup. And I, I actually hope this continues and for both groups to continue to stay on the sideline for, for the time being. Um, and if, if, as long as gold's moving higher, the less participation we have from the, the Western world, the better. And I think they will come at some point here and then add another, another boost um, to what's already been very strong uh, price action. Um, but as you know, followers of, of this space know, this move has been driven almost exclusively by panic central bank buying. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you can't understate this data point. Going all the way back to when records were first kept in the 1950s, we've seen more central bank buying of gold in 2022 and then in 2023 than in any other year since, since the 50s. Um, and look, I mean, I, I think I can point directly to why this is the case. And uh, as you know, all gold bugs are huge Joe Biden supporters. I, I say that I say that tongue in cheek, of course. Um, but I think we can we can thank Biden for uh, his his decision to cut Russia off of the the SWIFT system uh, back in back in February of 2022 with with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and honestly, it, it makes sense for central banks to be divesting from the U.S. dollar uh, within their foreign currency reserves. Um, I'm not saying that. Central banks are going to holding no dollars, but you know, rather than having 70% of your foreign currency reserves, after seeing what happens if you cross the United States and uh, you know, it's perceived foreign policy interests, maybe it makes sense to go down to 30 or 40%. So I think we're seeing a, a, rush, a rush to diversification here. And this is the explanation for why we're having this move. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence that you know the historical inverse relationship that we've, we've seen hold very tightly between gold and, and real interest rates broke just months after, after the, uh, the Ukraine invasion. Um, so I think that's what's going on. And I think there's, there's you know, room for another leg whenever 
the, the Western world uh, kind of moves into this asset uh, space and force. And, and that will come. Uh, maybe it'll take the broader stock market to break um, and for there to be some volatility. Um, but I, I believe that will come. Yeah, there's a number of, of thoughts I have on this. I think the first one is, um, you know, if I if I go back in time five years ago, let's say to like 2019, and you told me gold's going to be 2250 on March 29th, 2024, and I would be like, "Wow, that's going to be great! I'm going to be much much wealthier. <laughs> We're going to be rich." <laughs> We're going to be rich (laughs) of 10 X on our junior portfolios. Right. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I don't know about 10 X, but definitely much higher than where my portfolio is at today. Right. And the lack of enthusiasm is, is really remarkable. Um, I love to make these tweets talking about gold miners and comparing to various things, like I did one with, uh, you know, Agnico and Dope, pretty viral last week. I'm making those kinds of tweets because I always get so many people saying, but what about this miner? Or why is my portfolio not doing well? Or, you know, Agnico is only back to 60. It should be at 100, right? Like everybody is in, you know, resistance to the mining sector. Nobody likes it, you know, even the ones who are invested in it don't like it. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. You know, so when you see gold going to 2240, 2250, what, does it change anything in your process? Do, does anything change in, in your day-to-day activities? Well, we're fully deployed. So, so the short answer is, is no. Um, I think I, I mentioned this when we, when we last spoke in November, um, but we went for a, a pretty um, tough eight months in, in 2023 without adding a single new name to the portfolio. We, you know, we did some, some you know, trimming and some dollar cost averaging and existing names. But it was a, lo- a long period of, of inactivity between February of 23 and uh, early October of 23. Um, and I actually wasn't surprised seeing the juniors suffer last year. But what did completely surprise me was that the broader markets were continuing to, to march higher. And there wasn't a larger risk off of that. I, I foresaw a weakness in the juniors in 2023, but driven by a risk off move in the broader markets. And that, that clearly did not come to pass. And we, we came to this juncture, this, this inflection point in, in October is kind of where, where I rang the bell, um, where the price action and sentiment was just so bleak, so despondent for, for the juniors, that even though I hadn't seen that broader market uh, roll over as I'd anticipated, Made the decision to to plug uh, plug my nose and 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 get uh, get a bit aggressive um, with the the cash position that we we built up into the into the the low to mid uh, double double digits, um, and so between mid October and mid January, um, we participated in four different financings, um, two of them with private companies, um, two of them uh, public um, companies. Uh, two gold focused, um, two copper focused, and since mid January we've been we've been fully deployed. Um, so you know, as it stands, I'm not reacting uh, at all to what we're seeing uh, with with the metal price, uh, particularly gold. Um, but I will just say, generally, from a narrative perspective, I mean, I'm extremely bullish. Like I'm at table pounding levels of enthusiasm at this point. Um, particularly, you know, as, as you know, because we haven't seen really any reaction, uh, amongst, amongst the juniors, despite gold's convincing breakout higher, which I'm, I'm now convinced is, is the real deal. Um, maybe, maybe we saw some price action yesterday, uh, that suggests that the, the junior market is beginning to, to stir from its, its long slumber. Um, I mean, in the MJG portfolio, we had five advancers to every, every one decliner. 
And I believe we had six different holdings that were were up over 5%, including a few that were up over 10% on the day on a very light, light volume, mind you. Um, but perhaps, perhaps yesterday was a turning point. Um, but I would still say for anybody listening and for my own expectations, I'm, I'm still assuming it's going to be another four to eight weeks of frustration um, before we see any any life return to the juniors. I'd, I'd like to be mistaken, but that is that is kind of um, what I'm anticipating because I, I remember back to the the COVID crash of, of 2020, and uh, you were you were well in, involved with the market at that time as well. And gold bottomed in mid March. I remember an incredibly frustrating April and May, where we saw very little movement within the MJG portfolio, even though the gold price was on its way higher on a really strong run through August. And it really wasn't until June, so you know, a full two and a half months after gold had had bottomed, before we saw the juniors really run and and run they did. Um, we, we ended up 2020, we ended up the, the year 115%. But if you look back to our trough in, you know, mid to late March, the portfolio more than tripled and that occurred, you know, largely during the summer and, and fall months. So this, this can take time to play out. And I understand folks frustration that haven't been through these, these type of, of moves before, but it does take a while for the money to actually triple trickle down to the juniors. Um, but I don't think this time is, is different. And, and then I'd also say, I, I think the implications are beyond just the PM focused juniors, the precious metal focused juniors. Um, I'm, I'm not saying this is an immutable law of the universe. It could be different this time, but more often than not, gold does seem to be the bellwether of, of the, of the broader metals complex. I, I can't tell you exactly why that's the case. Um, but this was certainly true in COVID, as you'll remember. You know, precious metals and precious metals equities were were very much in vogue. You know, into late 2020, and then in 2021, um, we saw the rest of the metals complex take the baton. And then, as we moved into 2022, that's when you know some of the uh, critical minerals or battery minerals really really shine the uh, the lithiums and uh, and and rare earths of, of the world. So it doesn't have to play out like this again by any by any means, but I also I also wouldn't wouldn't bet against it. Yeah, I mean, every cycle is different. You know, that's what I've learned. But you, your your points are are well taken about the twenty twenty uh, market environment and how the juniors really didn't move much in April, and the 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 seniors were moving. Um, they were breaking higher by the end of April. Um, yesterday was a major technical confirmation day across the precious metal sector. And one of the stocks that I, I tend to use for that sort of confirmation that is risk on in the miners is core mining, CBE. So CBE was up 5.6% on Friday, its second consecutive 5% update. Robert. Yeah. Robert, just to jump in, I'm getting a fair amount of feedback. I'm not sure if that's on on your end or my end, um, but I, I I caught most of what you were saying there. How's this um, sound? That sounds uh, clear. Okay. That sounds great. Yeah. So so core mining um, breaking out to new high new. Uh, I don't think it's a 52 week high, but it's a it's a it's a multi multi month high um, and up two days. 5% back to back. Um, so definitely, you know, when you see core move like this, it is, it is risk on in the uh, precious metals miners. Uh, Cause that's about as high beta a name as you can get. Um, that's right. Yeah, especially when it comes to silver. I had an interesting anecdote yesterday where an investor that I, I very much respect uh, who despises silver and, and always has, I think somewhat, somewhat irrationally <laughs> or, or maybe to too much of a degree but he mentioned he was buying some silj yesterday for some for some exposure um to the metal which which completely caught me off guard um so i think some folks are looking ahead becoming more and more convinced that this this gold move is real and then saying what are the what are the implications for silver here 
um, which would have to more than double from its current levels to reach all time highs where gold has made new all time highs, uh, you know, each of the past uh, two days. Yeah. I mean, um, gold at twenty five dollars, you know, an ounce is, is nothing impressive at all. I mean, really, we need to, you know, you know, as you said, we need to break out above twenty six, but we really need to break out above thirty to get the juices flowing. So silver is definitely still sort of a non-confirmation of this the, this move in gold. I do want to ask you, um, what has the MGG fund been up to in the last few months, uh, you know, since we last spoke? Yeah, well, you know, as, as I was saying, we were very active between the October and uh, and, and mid January period, um, and have been largely sitting on our hands from a from a fully deployed position. Um, trim, trimmed a couple names for for disparate reasons, um, but we're you know we're at a one you know less than one percent cash position as it stands. So we do not have much of a cash buffer, um, and we'll see how that we'll see how that plays out. Um, I'm feeling a little more confident that the very uncomfortable decision to get aggressive. Between mid October and uh, in mid January, may may end up being justified. Um, it was com- uncomfortable again because I had not seen the broader market roll over as anticipated, and that's that's still a concern of mine. Um, but so far, so good. Um, the two private companies that we invested in, you know, behind the scenes, uh, are are pushing ahead, um, and the two public names that we we invested in. Are up, you know, thirty three percent and two hundred fifty percent from the placement uh, price that that we came in at. So, you know, we we would have we did better by putting that money to work than sitting in that double digit cash position. Um, even though juniors really did slide through February, and February is a really really rough month. Um, March March we've seen some improvement, but as we've discussed, we're definitely not off to the races uh, quite quite yet. Um, but yeah, but as ba- as it stands, you know, monitoring our our holdings very closely, news release to news release, and um, you know, there, there's very few true buy and holds within the MJG portfolio. Um, I think on a previous call we talked about Kenderlin Minerals. That's one of the names that I would put in that that category where I'm you know very very comfortable. Sitting on that position and highly unlikely to, you know, sell um, on on a on a bad news release per se. Um, Altius Minerals is is another name that I that I wrote about in our most recent um, investor letter, which came out in, in January. I would I would certainly throw that into the buy and hold category as well. Um, but for the rest of the portfolio, you know, vast majority of these names are on a on a short leash, and if I see what I perceive to be misbehavior by management or misalignment or a lack of confidence or the company's doing good work and flat out don't get lucky. A permit's denied, a drill program doesn't go to plan, you know, a, a, a country's government falls and a anti-mining regime comes in. There's a whole host of, of things that can go wrong in this industry that's entirely out of the company's control. Um, and so I'm, I'm watching closely and we'll, we'll, make, we'll make decisions as, as, as they present themselves. Um, you know, realistically, I don't anticipate adding any additional names <clears throat> to the portfolio until, you know, June time frame at the very soonest. Um, the fund is open ended. So there is the potential for uh, for inflows in the meantime, and that could change circumstances. But I, by and large, I, f- I feel like we've placed placed our bets and I'm monitoring things closely. But, you know, don't expect a, a flurry of additional placements out of MJG or you know, newly initiated open market positions in the in the coming couple months here, at least. Fully invested. All right, uh, you've you've made your bets, and uh, now it's time to um, be right and sit tight. There's been... <laughs> I was going to say to live or die with the consequences. <laughs> yeah. I prefer to live. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of transactions announced in the last few months. I'm not sure which ones really caught your eye or which ones you'd like to talk about. Mako and Gold Source recently, um, you know, Orion, uh, B2 Rupert, that whole saga, which 
seems to have just kicked off. We we haven't um, we haven't seen a response really. Um, but just yeah, you know, just interested in your thoughts in some of the you know of the M and A that's been going on. Sure. Well, we've seen we have seen a flurry of of activity, and I, I was a bit concerned that the conclusion of the Newcrest uh, Newmont merger and uh, Newmont stated intention to divest six of their of their assets would potentially press the pause button on M and A activity. Um, that does not seem to be the case. Though to be fair, the deals that have been announced this week have almost certainly been in the works for at least 90 days, uh, if not longer. These things don't happen overnight. Um, but I'd like to think that this is evidence that the deals will continue and that Newmont sales aren't going to put too much of a pause on, on people's plans. Um, I mean, the, the most recent ones, the, the Mako and Gold Source merger, that one was of, of interest to me. I, I visited San Albino. Uh, down in in Nicaragua uh, in late 2019, and that was before shit really hit the fan um, with the Ortega government there and their relationship with the the United States and the and the broader broader Western world. Um, I think, given the circumstances, uh, both both politically and just the difficulty to 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 ramp up a, a mine, uh, especially for a company with no other producing assets, Mako's done uh, commendably. So, so kudos to CEO Akiba Leesman there. Um, and in terms of this deal with with Gold Source, I think the the synergy here is really the people. Um, it's extremely important that Steve Parsons, uh, CEO of Gold Source, <clears throat> is staying on as president of of the combined company Merge Co. Um, and then, even more importantly, Eric Fear. Um, who we know from Silvercrest, extremely reputable, extremely experienced. I, I, I respect him a lot. Um, he's, he's staying on as the company's chairman on what seems to be a go forward basis. And interestingly, one of the key unsung heroes for Mako uh, and the, the relative success they've had in, in tough circumstances in Nicaragua has been their COO, Jesse Munoz. Um, you know, he's been in the industry for almost four decades and he spent much of that time in Mexico. Um, so he knows Eric fear very well. Um, they've been colleagues, uh, either working together or, or near each other and exchanging notes for, you know, going, going way back to the turn of the century. So in a way, this is a bit of the, the band getting back together. And, um, you know, I don't think there's going to be as many growing pains as, you know, you would typically expect if you have a, a merger of two management teams that have that have hardly met um so i'm i'm rooting for success there of course um you know the other big saga that has just just come to an end is this uh perseus and uh silver court battle um for the nyanzaga uh, gold asset in tanzania and that that's that the saga has been going on since uh late last year um finally silver Corp seems to have stepped out and i think Perseus has won this this battle um, and will be taking over Oracorp and, and hence the asset. And as a disinterested observer, um, you know, I would say uh, this is this is the right outcome. Um, Perseus are experts at mining gold in Africa. Uh, there's no two ways about it. All their operations are on the continent um, and they're, they're clearly a better fit to take this asset in production than Silvercorp. Um, which has no presence uh, in Africa whatsoever. Um, so in this case, I, I hope it works out for Perseus, um, you know, the local communities around Nyanzaga and, and Tanzania more generally. And after a really rough decade, last decade, um, there's, there seems to be a bit of, of a resurgence uh, in country um, between Life Zone and, and BHP um, pushing pushing things forward. Um, between Barrick, you know, mending, mending their relationship with the, the central government. Um, there's been some ICSID, uh, International Arbitration Court, um, you know, uh, decisions recently. Uh, and, and so, you know, some wounds are being mended there. And, and now we have Perseus, a credible African operator. I, I believe Perseus is actually the fourth largest gold miner in terms of total ounces produced in, in all of Australia, um, which, which might catch some, some folks by surprise. Um, you know, coming in, into Tanzania. So, so interesting movement there. 
And then obviously the most recent activity we've seen is the, uh, the Alamos Argonaut uh, merger. And, you know, of, of the three that we've discussed, this one, ha- you know, has the clearest by far operational synergies um, with Argonaut's very troubled Magino mine up in Ontario, literally adjacent to Alamos Gold's uh, producing Island Gold uh, project. And Alamos is going to be able to save hundreds of millions of dollars on a potential mill expansion that they've been contemplating uh, at Island. Um, and, and perhaps <laughs> just as importantly or more importantly, um, uh, Argonaut has a newly constructed tailings storage facility that Alamos will now be able to, uh, to use. And, you know, these are expensive, but more importantly, it'll take 10 years um, to, to permit and, and ultimately build. Um, so that's not invaluable, but that's that's a huge part of the acquisition right there. Um, I'd say the only negative here, as I see it, is the uh, the spinco of the uh, the Mexican and, and U.S. you know non core assets that were within Argonaut. Um, you know, from my perspective, there's plenty of gold companies out there already, um, plenty of options for investors to choose from, um, and so kind of the less that are out there the better for, for our interests. So that was the only downside from, from this deal. Um, but the market clearly liked it. I was, I think it's very notable that Alamos traded up on the day that the deal was announced. And especially over the past, really since 2011, past decade plus, there's, it's few and far between the instances where we've seen the acquirer actually see positive price action on the day the deal was announced. So perhaps that just speaks to the quality of the deal and the market's enthusiasm, or perhaps that speaks that we've turned a, turned a corner here, at least with the larger gold equities, and we might see more of that reaction to acquisitions uh, going forward. Time will tell. Yeah, with, you know, with the Alamos deal, I mean, that deal makes a lot of sense as you lay it out. Uh, makes a ton of sense. And yeah, the market reaction really spoke volumes to me. I mean, it was up 7% following the announcement of the, um, the acquisition, which I can't recall the last time I saw a gold miner respond to acquiring another company with a 7% rally. Um, so maybe some of it was definitely the sector and the gold price move, but I think it was also just people really like this deal. Yeah, it's a it's a combination of those two factors, I believe. I just don't know the weighting yeah. one way or another. So we'll have to see the next time there's a big high profile merger and how the uh, the names react. And if we see the acquirer trade up on that news as well, then maybe we've seen a, a shift in sentiment. It's just one one anecdote we can we can look for yeah. when we see the next big ticket merger occur. You mentioned Perseus, which brings us to the Ivory Coast, and um, there's a company. A junior that's made a new discovery or made some new, you know, discoveries, plural, in the Ivory Coast. And that is Awale, um, A-R-I-C, is a symbol on the venture. You know, and Awale had a news um, Monday morning with a drill result from Charger Target at, at the ODNE project in Ivory Coast, um, and it was it was absurd. Forty five points, forty five point seven grams per ton gold over thirty two meters, hole eighty three at Charger. And I want to get your 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 thoughts on a Wale and maybe Ivory Coast, and we can talk about you know Africa more broadly. But I I would just want to point out one thing that sort of has my, um, you know, like has me thinking, you know, this morning, if I think about recent, you know, discoveries, and when I say recent, I mean, let's say the last like six, seven years, there was Garibaldi, uh, or, you know, stories. I don't know if it was a new discovery, but it was a story for a while that it could be a new discovery. Garibaldi, Novo, Great Bear. Um, Snow Lion comes to mind. Snow Lion, okay. Yeah. But it's with Garibaldi, Novo, and Great Bear, these were all 
um, at places, projects, where there had been a lot of work done in the past. And in Novo, for example, I mean, they're finding gold nuggets in Western Australia, which is like, you know, literally the place on earth that is known for gold nuggets. And obviously they had a new spin on it, but it was, it really wasn't anything new. And Grave Bear, the, that project had been drilled before, but they took a whole new approach to it and they found something that nobody had, 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 had found previously. With, you know, a Wale, this has never been drilled. And I, right. I didn't know that until two weeks ago. I, I just figured, I assumed that this was a rehashed project. And it was only when I forced myself to really dig into it and learn about it, I was like, wow, this is really incredible. Because Rangold had this um, at some point in the 90s. And they did some basic work there, but they never drilled it. Um, and so it, it's, it's, you know, remarkable to me and it does, you know, remind me of Snowline in, in some ways because Snowline was a new discovery. Like that was really new. Like nobody had been there before. Um, and to, to, to drill 45.7 grams over 32 meters in something that is completely green field is really impressive. Yeah. No, point, point well taken. I mean, I, I think there was at least one previous drill program at, at Odiani, but your, your point still stands. A small drill program, and this is just a massive land package that they have out, uh, out there in a, in a place that is not picked over um, from, from a gold mining perspective. So, yeah, truly a grassroots, uh, you know, green fields discovery that we've had here. And, I mean, it's, it's super exciting for the space. Um yeah, 32 meters, 46 grams per ton gold is simply an insane intercept. Um, I think S SCP, that's um, the the former Sprott investment banking arm, which which last year separated. Um, they're calling it the 10th best gold intercept ever recorded in Africa. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I quite I quite buy that, um, but it's definitely top 10 since the turn of the century, um, not top three, and. Um, you know, to a Wally's credit, this is very consistent intercept as well. It doesn't appear to be a nuggety deposit. Hardly any smearing at all. No smearing at all, I would say, based on the one meter uh, composites that they provided in the uh, in the news release. <clears throat> and it's it's also relatively shallow at, uh, what is it, 165 meters or so or so of depth. Um, so huge discovery, share price reaction, well warranted. Um, this is a breccia pipe. And so the key questions now, specifically for this charger target, is, you know, firstly, how deep does this specific pipe go? And, and what's its geometry? Um, Joe Mazumdar put out a good note yesterday in his Exploration Insights newsletter, speculating, you know, just, you know, with very broad strokes, what we'd have to see for this specific pipe um, to be a multi-million ounce uh, deposit. And I think we need to see it go down 450, 500 <clears throat> meters, you know, assuming a cylinder, assuming similar grades, assuming an SG of three, you know, what have you. There's a lot of assumptions, but that's all you can do at this very early stage. Um, and so, yeah, the first question is how deep does the specific pipe go? Um, second question are, is, are there other pipes to be found and do they find them? Um, a third would be, you know, is there an intrusive source? somewhere down there. There probably is, but is it at a reasonable depth and are they able to tag into it where we could see the widths, you know, even blow out, blow out further? And, and, and what does that mean? So as it comes to charge, or those are kind of the three big open questions that I have. And then there are secondary questions, you know, more broadly for the, the company, you know, and for their partner, uh, Newmont, who's earning into, uh, I believe, 65 maybe 75 percent uh stake here for 15 million in, in expenditures you know what what do the other targets hold this is not a small property um you know there are other targets uh lando uh bbm scepter um you know do we see anything close to these these drill intercepts elsewhere on the property um and, and programs to come 
Um, another question specific to Awale shareholders is when does Awale raise next? You know, they're not sitting on a boatload of cash as it, as it stands. They're not in a desperate position either, but they will have to finance at some point here. And then there's the strategic question, you know, again, more specific to a Wale at this point. You know, what does a Wale do with the cash when they do raise next? Um, do they lengthen out runway as much as possible and let do, Newmont do the work, work for them um, and kind of build up their, their treasury for when they'll likely have to start contributing uh, to this JV? Or do they get a bit more aggressive and do work on their 100% own ground? This is an interesting one in that, you know, of the total land package, the JV only sits on one third of it. So about two thirds of the overall land package is actually 100% owned by a wallet. Um, and what do they plan to do with it, that ground, if anything? So more unanswered questions than answered at this point. Um, but it's, it's definitely captured the market's attention. And I'm, I'm really th- thrilled for the players involved. Um, I mean, kudos to, to Bakashin uh, Pekovic, um, who's somebody that I've, I've, I've become friendly with over the past uh, few years here. Um, and, and there are a couple other existing shareholders who recognize that Awale's previous management wasn't doing shareholders any favors. And I, I won't get into the details there, but that could be a, a conversation for you to have um, at, an, at another day. Um, and they caused a fuss. And, you know, credit for Stephen Stewart and, and his org group for having a look, you know, recognizing the, the potential opportunity here. And uh, coming in and, and getting the house in order. And, and this is a very rare instance of shareholder activism already working in this space or, or actually working in this space. Um, you know, my, my general view is that it's not worth the time or effort. Um, it's very hard to, to push out an entrenched management team. And there are so many fish in the, in the junior C. It's better to find a, a quality team that's aligned and doing good work to back. Than, than try to fix one of these, uh, you know, broken winged uh, situations. But in, in this case, they've done a great job. And no matter how it plays out, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting to see from that perspective. And then you, you touched on this in your question, but it's, it's also worth recognizing and you know, taking a step back. The gold scene is really heating up in the Ivory Coast um, as we speak. Um, in addition to what we're seeing with Awale, one just has to look at, at Montage. And um, they've more than they've seen their share price basically double in the past five weeks um, in the aftermath of the Lundin family, you know, doubling down on that story and getting their share ownership position up close to 20 percent, I think 18 percent to be exact. And then also a new team, you know, coming in with, you know, specific expertise in, in, in mind building there. So, you know, that's another Ivory Coast based gold story that's seen a lot of love. Um, just in the very, very recent past. Um, and then you have a company like Kulu Gold. And I, I should say, full disclaimer, we don't own Kulu directly, um, but we do have some exposure through Kenlin Minerals and their, their 13% stake um, in Kulu. Kulu just announced a 10,000 meter drill program. So healthy sized program here at their, their Sakasu project, also in the Ivory Coast. And that company is still private. Uh, but perhaps we see them accelerate their their go public plans here in the aftermath of these these recent events. But it does seem like the junior world's attention has shifted to gold uh, in the Ivory Coast, and um, we'll we'll see if that continues. It'll be <laughs> that story is kind of on the shoulders of a Wale and to a lesser degree Montage. Um, but if we keep seeing success, uh, that's that's good for everybody in the uh, in the country. I would argue. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and another angle, you know, on the Awali story is that, you know, we, we don't know how the story is going to gonna play out. You know, we don't know if Charger is going to be 3 million ounces or 300,000 ounces. We, we've got no clue at this point. It's a, it's a great intercept, but there's a lot more, you know, work to be done. But it is proof that... Uh, there's, you know, new discoveries still to be made in this world. And it's still possible to drill 32 meters of 46 grams gold, you know, in, in something completely untouched, you know. Um, and, you know, they picked up this project in 2017. So if we think back to 2017 gold market, 
that was very much a bear market year. That was on the the, the tails, the the tail of that terrible 2012 to 2015 time period. Um, and they were able to, um, you know, acquire a couple of permits and then stake five more uh, large clean blocks um, and, and build this over time and then attract the, you know, interest of the number one gold company in the world uh, to, to their credit and, and to the CEO Chubb's credit. Um, but yeah, let's move on, you know, from a Wally and Ivory Coast. I think point well taken, that country is definitely improving a lot from many standpoints, especially from a gold mining standpoint. Uh, and they also have a good football team. Um, <laughs> your, your recent trip, you went to the Horn of Africa. Do you have any uh, takeaways from that trip, Matt? Yeah, I've been to the Arabian Nubian Shield now twice in the in the past 12 months. And um, it's a fascinating trip. Eritrea is a country I've wanted to visit all the way since 2011, when I met one of my very good, good friends in university, um, who'd lived in Seattle his whole life, but was actually born in, in Eritrea, and, and then had immigrated with his, his family to the, uh, to the United States. Um, certainly not a country that's on many folks' radars more generally, but even within the, the mining space, um, if you go back 15 years, you know, there are probably at least a dozen Western juniors active within, within the country. Um, now there are only three and two of them are private. Um, the, the one exception there being alpha exploration with their Krakasha project. Um, so we were able to, as a group of, of six of us, a couple of geologists from a major mining company that have, that's actually already been mentioned on this call. Um, and then some, some analysts and other, other prospective investors. And we journeyed out to their, their project. It's, it's a fascinating one. I mean, they have three different, completely different styles of mineralization. They've got your classic orogenic gold. And that's where they've been seeing um, some, some love recently with, with the drill bit. Um, they have a gold-rich porphyry target um, to, the, to the east of that. And then way farther to the east of that, on the eastern flank of their property, they have some some interesting uh, VMS um, potential there as well. And, you know, follower, followers of Eritrea will know that the, the finest mine discovered in country was a VMS deposit. And that was, that was the Bisha deposit, now mine, um, formerly with Nevsun Resources, now, now operated by Zijin Mining. And it was cool. It was a seven-hour drive out to site from the, the capital of Asmara. And along the way, we, we probably passed two dozen, um, you know, yellow cabbed trucks, which were, were taking ore, uh, or taking concentrate rather from, from Bisha uh, to, to the coast for, for shipping, uh, presumably to, to China. Um, so in, incredible mineral wealth and mineral potential within the country. Um, you know, there, there, there are quite a few risks, of course, and there is a reason why there's not much Western attention. Um, on the country. Uh, it's, it's pretty closed off. Really the only major power they're doing a significant amount of business with at the moment uh, is the Chinese. Um, and that will probably remain the case here. Um, uh, but their, their leader, uh, Fuerke, who's been in, in power for, for three decades now, is, is getting older. Um, and at some point, the baton will be handed off in one form or another. And, uh, you know, the, the hope uh, is that the country opens up a little more um, than it than it is than it is currently, um, but you know taking a step back, the ANS runs from Ethiopia through Eritrea, through Sudan, through Egypt, across the Red Sea into Yemen. And I don't think there's uh, all too much exploration activity going on in that country at the moment, unfortunately, um, and then into Saudi. And I think over the next ten years, this is going to be perhaps the hottest <laughs> mineral belt uh, mineral belt out there just because it hasn't been, it hasn't been touched largely. Um, and, you know, there is reason for that. There's quite a bit of jurisdictional risk really across all of those countries for, for disparate reasons. Um, but just look at the actions of the big boys and that speaks to the scale of the opportunity across this whole mineral belt. You have Bristow um, active on both sides of the Red Sea in uh in Egypt and, and of course in Saudi, you have Friedland <clears throat> with with Ivanhoe Electric, 
um, you know, uh, investing quite a bit of money in exploration in, in Saudi at the moment. And so I think it's a, it's a region, a region to watch. Um, as it stands, our exposure is confined to Egypt primarily. And then we have some royalty exposure in uh, Ethiopia's Tigray region as well. And that's through a company that I've written about publicly for a few uh, investor letters now. That's Elemental Altus. Um, they also have a large royalty package in, in Egypt as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating region, even if, you know, uh, put mining aside, fascinating region, fascinating people, culture, uh, political situation. Um, but yeah, geologically, it has all the ingredients for major VMS deposits. Uh, orogenic gold is prevalent across the whole belt. Um, porphyries are definitely, uh, present on the Eastern side of the Red Sea. So in, in Saudi, there's there's some debate in terms of the the true porphyry potential um, in the Horn of Africa, so on the western side of the Red Sea. Um, but there have been a couple found, and I think you know conventional opinion is shifting to that there's there's porphyry potential um, in the Horn as well. Uh, so a lot going on, and in a, in a region to watch for those without uh, you know any any exposure. We're coming up on. Uh, last 15 minutes, but I want to ask this question from James Qantas. Um, he asks you, Matt, what do you think of the Alti as 1.5% royalty on the silicon and, you know, Merlin deposits, uh, 13 million ounce gold deposits there in uh, the Walker Lane trend? Yeah, great, great question. Something I'm watching very closely. Um, firstly, I'll just say this is one of the great unsung discoveries in, in recent years. And I think, you know, part of the reason for, for, for this is that it's kind of hidden within the broader Anglo Gold Ashanti portfolio. So it's not been made by a junior and hence maybe it's not getting as much attention um, from folks like us that are that are on this call or listening to this call. Um, but that is a deposit that's going well north of 20 million ounces total across the full land package in arguably the best mining jurisdiction globally, full, full stop. Um, and it's, it's so significant to Anglo that they've actually relocated, you know, traditionally a, an African focused con uh, company, they've re relocated their head headquarters to, uh, to Denver, if I'm not mistaken, uh, yeah, Denver, Colorado. Um, and I think that speaks to the fact that they believe this is a, a company maker, um, for them. So the lay of the land there from a royalty perspective is that origin um, of which Altius owns 17%, I believe, a good chunk of the company, um, owns a 1% NSR over the Silicon Merlin discovery. And I actually think it's likely that those two ore bodies will, uh, will join in, into one, but as of now, we'll call that Silicon Merlin. Um, you know, that, that royalty is not in, in question. Um, so that's, that's an extremely valuable asset for Origin. And I think reason to believe that Origin could be taken out really at any time by the largest gold royalty players. You know, the Francos or Royal Golds of the world. It's truly of scale where they would, they're, they're certainly paying attention. And then you have Altius, um, which holds a one and a half percent NSR, also over Silicon Merlin. And that part of the royalty is not in question, um, but the actual bounds of the royalty, um, at least by the letter of the law, is out to the very extremity of the broader expanded Silicon project. Um, Anglo Gold um, disputes this. So the, the royalty is actually going on, undergoing arbitration at the moment. And there's a key date coming up, April 6th. So we're just, just a few days away from this, um, where an arbitration court in Vancouver um, will be deciding, you know, whether Altius is one and a half percent NSR, um, covers the whole contiguous land package, or whether it's confined to the you know, more to, to, to where the Silicon Merlin uh, deposit is. Either way, it's, it's, it's going to be extremely valuable for Altius. Um, but they're clearly confident that this case will be settled in their favor. Uh, if that was not the case, they, they probably would have cut a deal with, with, with Anglo Gold long, long ago. Um, so the, 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 the case will be heard April 6th. There's no exact timetable for when the results will be made public, but 
it's probably reasonable to assume within the next, you know, 60 to 90 days, we should have a definitive ruling on that. And then once that occurs, Altius is clearly not going to make any decisions before there's some finality there. Um, Altius has an interesting decision to make. I mean, they, they pride themselves on being a, a, a mining royalty company with a specific focus on non-precious metals. So if it's anything but gold and silver, they're interested. Um, but now they're in, in, in a position where their most valuable um, development stage royalty is, is purely gold focused. And so they're, they're going to have to make a strategic decision here. Three options on the table for them, largely, I guess, I guess four. Um, first would just be to keep it within the, the Altius portfolio, recognizing the value of it, recognizing that this is going to be a multi-decade mine. This is not a 10 or 12 or 15 year gold mine. This is a mine that will be churning out 500,000 ounces a year for, for 20 years plus. Um, you know, second option would be to sell it and or swap it with one of the major gold royalty companies that are getting, you know, better premiums on their cash flow than, than Altius. So, you know, a Franco or Royal Gold would, would come to mind. They could take cash for it if they thought the price was right, or they could take um, a non-precious metal royalty within the portfolios of, of one of these bigger, you know, primarily gold focused royalty companies and bring that into the fold. That's, that's the second option. Third would be to spin it out into a standalone company, you know, Altius gold royalties. Um, and then fourth would maybe be to put it into origin and then take what would be a decidedly controlling stake in origin. Um, I honestly don't know which way they're going to go. Um, you know, Brian Dalton ag- uh, addressed this in pretty good detail on Altius's most recent quarterly call. He seemed to be not ruling out entirely, but uh, it seemed that they're unlikely to do option either option three or option four. So I, I don't think it's it's likely that they'll spin it out or put it into origin. But those are still you know, viable options as it stands. Um, so I, I, I believe they're deciding between whether to um, to sell it to one of the big boys or more specifically swap it maybe for a, another long life, non-precious metal royalty and some cash, or just keep it within the, the Altius portfolio and, uh, you know, understand that this is going to become a cash cow for them later this decade and uh, and ride with it. So Brian has been clear. They're, they're probably going to make a decision one way or another this year. And uh, we, we'll probably know in early 2025 which 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 direction they're going here. And then we could we could speak another 30 minutes about what that might be worth, but we'll we'll table that for another day and, and how one might go about trying to calculate the valuation on that royalty. Sure. Final yeah. final topic, Matt. And I, this is an important one, so I definitely want to get this one in. Um, copper in in January in Vancouver at Myth, I got up there and I pounded the table on copper. And I said, this is a surreal moment in time that we're sitting here with copper at 375 a pound with all that's coming down the pipe over the next several years. Um, So far, that looks to be slightly correct. We're at 401 today. Um, But I want to pick your brain on what where, where copper might be heading in the next, I don't know, three years. Um, we, we see these deficit forecasts out there. You know, every, you know, investment bank has their own version of it, but uh, it's not looking great uh, out to 2026 and 2027. So where might copper prices be going? Hmm. Million dollar question there. I'll, I'll give you a range of numbers, but first, I, I would say I do agree with you. Um, I think the setup is decidedly bullish in copper. I have no idea what happens in the next six to nine months, but if you're looking over a three or five, five year time horizon, uh, this is a great metal to have exposure to. And uh, I, sh- I should add, actually, a, a third of our portfolio now, a third of the weighted MJG portfolio, is weighted towards copper focused stories. Um, you know, I should add this is not some extremely bold macro bet. Um, maybe in essence it is, but it's more that I've 
discovered what I view six, you know, very specific opportunities that I think are attractive with the people involved, the asset quality, the company structure, upcoming catalysts, all that good stuff that happens to be copper focused. But clearly I'm comfortable with the metal or we wouldn't be at this this weighting within the portfolio. And I think it, it all comes down to the supply side. I mean, the first point here is I think it's becoming increasingly understood that the incentive price necessary to really get these mega scale, you know, development projects being pushed forward aggressively by the big boys um, is, you know, five fifty to, to six dollars per pound copper. So we're talking a 40 to 50 percent move from current levels um, before these projects actually, you know, provide the the internal rate of return where it makes sense to, to, to bring them online. And uh, the big copper producers have been pretty disciplined and pretty clear with their messaging that they're not going to bring these projects forward until we see a markedly higher price. And I, I should also note, you know, Brian Dalton from the aforementioned Altius Minerals, um, he's made the important point that in previous metal cycles, it's not at all uncommon to see the spot price of a given metal need to rise sometimes to two times the incentive price um, before you really see the the big boys, you know, press the panic button and start throwing everything they have at, at bringing these projects online. Um, so that, that would take us into double digits if that were the case here. Um, and I think the other important point is whether whether the big boys get going at 550 or at nine or ten dollar copper. You know, these mega scale projects that have any chance of making a dent in global go, global copper demand, they take three, four, five years to to bring online. Um, and it's fraught with risk, uh, technical risk, um, financing risk. Uh, you know, th- these are such large scale projects that even the biggest miners in the world seem more comfortable partnering with one of their peers to push forward one of these these mega projects on a 50 50 basis rather than take on the, the daunting task on their own. So these this is a cumbersome, you know, this cumbersome projects to, to bring online. Uh, this is not your typical you know, 12, 12 to 18 month exercise, you know, for a, a relatively simple, you know, medium sized gold mine, uh, you can you can double or triple that uh, that time frame easily with copper, um, you know, and put another way of uh, reference, another good data point from Joe Mazumdar put out a graphic in his uh, his newsletter relatively recently. Um, if you look back at the lithium assets that have come online in, in the past couple decades, the average time frame from initial discovery to first production um, was somewhere between four to seven years, uh, depending on whether they were brine or, uh, or or hard rock lithium deposits. If you look at copper, 17 years. So that, that really speaks to even when we, we are in an incentive environment where we see these projects going online, um, it takes time. It takes a particular amount of time with copper. The only other metal that's comparable is, is nickel. That can be thanks to the nickel laterite deposits, which I would argue are are even harder than bringing a copper deposit online. But maybe that's a, a topic for another day. And then finally, I'll just add from a, a junior mining perspective. I mean, one of the reasons I'm very comfortable having this level of exposure to copper is just the amount of potential suitors um, that are out there for a junior that latches on to a, a new discovery or you know pushes forward a, 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 ro- a viable development stage project. Um, I mean, if you look at lithium, for instance, sure, there are some some major acquirers out there. There's, there's the SQMs, the Arcadiums, the Ald- Albemarles of the world. Um, Rio has shown some appetite for lithium, um, but but notably, you know, BHP or Valet really hasn't. Um, Glencore hasn't. Um, there are some Chinese groups, Zijin, CATL come to mind. But you know, of the potential big boy acquirers, we're we're, we're talking less than less than ten within the lithium space. And, and to be clear, I'm not not trying to throw shade on lithium. I think it actually, uh, you know, high quality uh, junior uh, junior names within the lithium space present an interesting contrarian opportunity with the price off you know eighty percent over the past twelve plus month uh, twelve plus months here. But if you if you look to copper and then run that same exercise. You know, you can't stop counting the amount of potential acquirers between all the big boys, the BHPs, Rios, Volleys of the world, you know, more than half a dozen groups in China. Um, the major gold miners, they're certainly not looking at lithium, but they've been very clear. They want as much copper exposure as possible. Bristow hasn't been shy from commenting on this 
Obviously, Newmont feels the same way, and, and that explains their their new crest acquisition. Um, we've seen sovereign wealth funds step up from the Middle East and looking at copper assets um, in, in in Eastern Africa. Um, and then, of course, the copper focused miners, the Freeports, Tex, Lundin Minings, Antivagast of, of the world. These groups are very clear they want to increase their copper exposure, and they're very comfortable with with the metal over the medium to long term. So there's a whole host of suitors if you if you latch on to, to something special. Um, and then to your question, where does where does the price go? That is uh, that is very treacherous territory because I do I do not have a functioning crystal ball, unfortunately. Well, that's um, really interesting what you said. Brian Dalton says sometimes it can go to 2x the incentive price. Now, if the incentive price is 550, that's eleven dollars a pound. That's a data point. That's a data point. It doesn't have to go to 2x the incentive price, but that is not an uncommon thing to occur um, with other metals in previous metal cycles. Um, one other data point, and this will provide a very broad range, um, but between late 20, sorry, late 2001 and early 2011, um, the last true copper cycle, the copper went from 60 odd cents per pound up to a little over 450. And it should be noted that was largely a demand driven cycle. So that that is a key difference between what I think we're going to see here over over this coming decade and perhaps a little bit into next. We saw the copper price go up seven and a half times from peak to trough. So if you were to repeat the same exercise here um, and look at copper from its you know recent cyclical lows of, of just around two dollars, um, that would take us to fifteen dollar copper. Which I think many would say is is quite aggressive, but I, I would argue it's within the realm of possibility. Um, you know, even if you took half of that magnitude, you know, three point seven five x from the trough of the cycle, that would take us to seven fifty. Um, and I think anybody with current copper exposure, if they could uh, hold their nerve over the inevitable volatility to come, would be quite happy to see copper at at seven fifty. You know, three or four years down the down the line. Um, so that's that's a potential range just looking back to the last cycle. But obviously, you know, and as you mentioned earlier on this call, all cycles are different. Um, and I think anybody that's saying definitively they know exactly where copper is going to go um, is either fooling themselves or, or fooling others. Yeah, I'll just leave it that one of the main copper, you know, deposits in the U.S., the, the Resolution Project in Arizona – this is a absolutely massive uh, capex build. It's a, been a permanent nightmare, and it's a thousand plus meters deep. So it's it's a great ore body. It's it's incredible, but not without significant nightmares along the way. And it's still not even built. It's definitely not close to operating. Um, and that's where the U.S. is counting to get a lot of its copper from in the future, right? So uh, a lot of risk. There's a lot of risk to the supply of, of copper. And um, as you pointed out, I mean, 550 incentive price, I think that, that, that says it all. You know, we're at 401, you know, today. So 550 is almost 40% above today's levels and and that you know it's not to say it's going to jump there in a month but it, it could it could come faster than than some people think uh you know it, it could definitely come faster than some people think it could but you know as a word of caution we could also see a uh you know a, a major temper tantrum from the broader markets and we could go into a risk-off period like we saw in early 2020 or to a somewhat lesser degree in the middle of 2022 and it's within the realm of possibility that we see $3 copper first. So I think people have to have realistic exp expectations and really stick with their convictions. It's never an easy ride and it, it never plays out exactly how you anticipate it will. Um, but I would argue if we see $3 copper, you know, early next year because of some, you know, major macroeconomic blow up, that would make me more, more positive and, and, and more bullish and, and not less, even though that, that could you know, be some, uh, or there would be some pain along the way. So I, I do want to put that word of, of caution out there. A, a voice of reason, Matt. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for me to, just to wrap my brain around copper going back to $3, 
in this environment or some future environment, that would be major economic pain. That would be China, you know, recession, you know, the, the U.S. is in, uh, you know, recession. Europe, it, it would be global. Uh, yeah. yeah, sharp, synchronized global recession, you know, with the Chinese, you know, bank banking system imploding. Yeah, and can you imagine what three dollar like if we had that move that like twenty five percent drop from from four to three, what that would do to the mining sector? It would be, <laughs> it would be freaking brutal. <laughs> All right, let's leave it on a positive note. Let's go back to the 550 thought. Okay, so 550 incentive price, but you are a voice of reason. It's not without risk, and it never happens exactly how we think it's going to play out. That's for sure. Matt, thank you so much for your time. This was extremely insightful. Um, it's a real pleasure, and I hope you have a good Friday and a great weekend. You as well, Robert. Thanks for, thanks sure. for pulling this together. Always fun. Thank you.